coordinated U.S. policy positions and activities with White House, State Department, and other agencies, collaborated with foundations, NGOs, and international organizations such as the World Bank and IEA, received Department of Energy Distinguished Service Award for Vision, Leadership, and Commitment to Public Service in 2014. It's very kind of you, sir. Graham, I now hand over the mic to you. Thank you very much, Ramamurthy Ji. It's uh, good to be here. Um, I always enjoy uh, speaking with, uh, with with Indian colleagues. I have a long uh, relationship with India. I think my first visit was uh, probably before many of you were born uh, in uh, 1989 as a young guy uh, backpacking around. Uh, my visits have uh, uh, all been a, a lot more official in uh, recent years <laughs> than that, but uh, still involve uh, eating some street food, much to the uh, dismay of my colleagues who, <laughs> who are a little bit afraid. But uh, now I, um, as, uh, as Mr. Ramamurti uh, mentioned in, in his very kind introduction, um, my uh, work in the US Department of Energy was uh, uh, actually involved a, a great deal of work with India uh, in, in coordinating activities under the clean energy ministerial process. I worked closely with uh, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, um, then under uh, Ajay Mathur, and then uh, also worked closely with uh, counterparts in the Ministry of Power. Um, so have have quite some uh, connection to uh, uh, to India very very much enjoy being uh, being in contact with you so um, what what I will do is uh, I think uh, best thing is to share my screen and I'll walk through a presentation that I have uh, just put together based on on the interest that um, was expressed. Uh, for for the topic areas, but of course we can we can ask. Uh, I mean, you can ask uh, the, the the questions as broadly or as narrowly as you like. But I've just tried to capture some of the latest trends and and thinking in the area um, as as it relates to um, the broader topic of energy efficient buildings, and then specifically to the role of cool roofs and. Uh, and then uh, talk a bit about cooling efficiency and uh, the HFC phase out. So these are these are the topics I, I intend to cover. So first of all, um, the uh, the reason we focus on buildings is that they represent 28% of global CO2 emissions uh, from building operations. Now, that seems like a large number. Um, uh, of course, these are, are not all direct emissions from buildings. This includes the carbon emissions associated with the electricity used by the buildings. In some parts of the world, it includes uh, heating from uh, boilers and, uh, um, you know, obviously in India, the heat load is less, but uh, the air conditioning load, is the elect electricity use uh, load is more. Of course, the challenge with buildings is that you have a lock-in. Once you build a building, it's going to be there for a very long time. So anything you do in the design and construction of the building today is going to be there for a very long time. Um, the, 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 the good news, as I said, is that buildings are a cost-effective climate mitigation solution. So all of the analysis that anybody ever does on what are the things that we can do uh, are typically not the sexy things, right? The sexy things are let's get some solar panels, let's do some wind turbines, let's do some electric vehicles, let's do some smart grids. Those are all the sexy things and they're all really good and really necessary. But the things that are not sexy are actually the cheapest things and that's efficiency in general. And building efficiency is a very, is, is a very significant one because of this large number, this 28% number. So it's possible now people are looking beyond just, just, just the efficiency of the building itself, but also including self-generation, right? If you put some solar panels on the roof, um, there's lots of roof area with low rise buildings, residential and, and you know, smaller commercial buildings, lots of potential for self-generation. 
at the level of the building or community, you can e even get to zero carbon buildings uh, potentially, right? So this is another big focus area. So people are now looking even at how do you go from efficient buildings to zero carbon by including some of the uh, self-generation potential. So th this is a global number, um, but if you look at how this breaks out by energy or emissions, it's similar. Uh, this is now looking overall at, uh, at, at uh, emissions from energy, and this is really looking at them through the lens of end use. Sometimes you'll see this at the level of the fuels, and they'll say how much is coal and oil and natural gas. This is at the level of end use, right? And so here's where you see uh, the, the, the numbers that if, if you take this, this is tw the 28%. And this is global, again, uh, residential direct emissions is 6%. Again, this is probably, uh, you know, thing, things like, uh, li like heating, residential indirect, or things uh, like the electricity use, it's 11%. There's non-residential direct and indirect as well. Some people like to include what are called embedded emissions, and uh, they'll, they'll first count the emissions associated with the construction industry, which is normally over here with other industry, but when they're looking at the housing or the building stock as a whole, they'll include the construction industry, and they'll even include the emissions from cement. And the cement process has a natural emission of carbon dioxide, and unless there's some use of substitutes, it, it is going to continue to represent a large source of, uh, of emissions from the building sector. So some people, when they're, when they're defining this zero carbon building uh, approach, they actually say, well, you shouldn't just zero out in, uh, you know, the emissions from, from the energy use. You should zero out the emissions from the embedded emissions in the building itself, the materials like the carbon dioxide or like the, uh, the cement um, that, that went into it that makes it an even more ambitious approach. But this is where these numbers are coming from, this 28% of, uh, of emissions from buildings. Now, uh, what's happening? What are the trends? So this is, uh, this is an IEA chart just showing recent trends from 2010 to 2018. And uh, here you have the increase in floor area. And floor area is increasing dramatically, right? It's, more buildings constructed because of the population, this orange line, but it's going even faster than population because people are being in, in, in bigger places, right? People wanna have bigger homes. There's also a commercial element of this. So floor area is increasing larger than population. You also have the increase in, in, uh, in uh, energy use, of course. And there was a bit of a pause with the emissions here which seemed like quite a good trend. It meant the floor area was increasing, but the emissions were not because you're making more efficient use of the energy. But now that has started to go back up and the projections are, are not good. Now this is the global, uh, the global scenario and I'll tell you a bit more about India specifically, but let me just say in India, this is really dramatic. So the increase in floor area in India is expected to be 400% by 2050, that's five times huge number of buildings uh, and increase in floor area in India. So under current patterns, uh, by 2050, carbon emissions from buildings will double. Efficiency gains, as I said, are lagging behind the floor area growth. So the emissions are rising. And globally, we saw it's more in India, but globally half the buildings that will exist in 2050 have not yet been built. We just pause for a moment. I mean, that's, that's amazing. We think 2050 is not that far away, right? So 30 years from now, the buildings we see will double, right? And those, depending on the technology we use to put, those, put into those buildings, those, the performance of those buildings will be locked in because you know that retrofits are far more expensive than, than design and construction, right? Better to do it right from the start than to have to go back and try to retrofit. Europe is dealing with us right now very much. Uh, Europe has very strong building regulations. Uh, they have agreed, the European Commission has, uh, has, has agreed to try to achieve a net zero carbon goal. And one of the things they struggle with the most is retrofits because they have a lot of old buildings in Europe. 
Some of them are protected by historical status. So they have to go and do very careful expensive retrofits. So I mentioned earlier that the, the mitigation potential, that is the how, um, how much the emissions can be reduced and, and how cost effective it is for, for different sectors. If you look at emissions from buildings, this is always these low cost emissions reductions. Everybody always says this efficiency stuff is really cheap. Now, the problem we know is that the, there are things in the sector that make it hard to realize these gains. If you're just adding up the numbers, you say, well, this is really cheap. But we know that the building sector is highly localized and fragmented. The incentives for efficiency are misaligned for any kind of commercial building or many, uh, you know, where, where there are, wherever there are renters. For something you may know, the principal agent problem, it's normally, it's normally called, that is the person who pays the bills, the, the electricity bills is not the building owner, it's the renter. It's the person who rents the building. So the owner says, why do I care? I'm not paying the bills. I don't need to make an efficient building. I'm just renting the space to somebody. His incentive is misaligned with the incentive of the renter who wants to have the cheap, uh, you know, a, a lower bill, right? Also, we know about building codes. We'll talk more about ECBC in India, but building codes are either not present. If you can believe 73 countries in the world, no building codes or they don't cover the entire sector. I think this is a, is a case with ECBC. Or of course, enforcement, right? We don't even have to get into the enforcement, which is again, normally something taken on at the local level and it uh, uh, varies widely. So if you look at the overall energy use coming from buildings, only 35% of the energy use in buildings was covered by policy in 2018. That means there's just a lot of unregulated use of, of energy. That, may, that means, for example, uh, I haven't gone into details on appliance standards here, but like the star rating system in, in, in India, from BEE, the, um, uh, there's, there's the uh, Energy Star and other things in, 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 in minimum standards in the US, there's the uh, letter system in, in the EU. So these appliance standards are, are a fantastic way of doing this, but you have uh, of achieving these reductions, but of course you have to ratchet them up over time because the technology improves. Yes, you have to worry about cost, um, but remember there's cost savings too. But this is, this is one of the problems I said with efficiency is um, when you calculate the lifetime cost, it's always cheaper, but the, un, the upfront cost is always the problem, right? And that's where you need some other policy mechanisms, these complementary policy mechanisms. Normally what you need to do, especially for people in, in, with uh, lower incomes, they don't have enough disposable income to make an investment in something that's more efficient, even if it will save them money in the long run. So you need lenders to be aware of the potential for the, for, for the benefits. So that there has to be some incentive for the lender, for some, for some knowledge, right? But then probably also some incentives for the lenders to, um, to, to lend money to the um, uh, to the people who might want to be buying particular appliances, financing schemes, uh, things like that. So, with energy efficiency, more than any other aspect of uh, of, of uh, energy policy, we always get into a discussion of the barriers. And the economists uh, always say, "Well, energy efficiency is very cheap," and then other people say. Yeah, it's like you have, uh, you know, you, you have 10,000 rupee notes lying around on the floor, but why isn't anybody picking them up? And they're not picking them up because there are policy barriers. They're things that keep prevent you from picking it up because first you have to pay some money <laughs> in order to get more money, right? So, um, so key factors for India specifically now, uh, massive growth in residential floor space is predicted. Existing policies give little focus to residential buildings. The ECBC focuses primarily on commercial buildings or buildings above a certain, uh, a certain level of energy use. You may know better about this than I do, some of you. So this is the latest information I have. I think uh, Karnataka did uh, uh, its own um, um, implementation of ECBC uh, in, the, in the past few years. Um, 
but I think it's still restricted to this energy use threshold. So probably larger commercial buildings, maybe some residential, um, if they're high rises or things that use a lot of, uh, a lot of energy. Um, codes and incentives are needed to encourage effic efficiency in, in, in uh, high rise buildings and more formal low rise buildings. That's, that's because, you know, typically, again, these are, these are rentals often, right? So people will, uh, it's, the, it's the misaligned incentive problem. Voluntary schemes are, are, are you know, they can be quite useful. There's the, the star rating scheme uh, for buildings. There's LEED India, um, India Green Building Council has ratings. Griha has, uh, has very good ratings and, and, and verification. Uh, that's put out by uh, Terry, I think. Um, uh, this is very useful, but they're voluntary. And so uptake is slow, right? If people aren't, aren't mandated to look at this. In all of these cases, the, uh, sort of the big, uh, the big gorilla in the room is uh, thermal comfort. Uh, I don't need to tell you, uh, Bangalore, fortunately, is not, not the worst impacted by this, but, uh, you know, the, the, uh, um, the, the hot season in uh, India is becoming unbearable in some, in some parts, right? So people um, are, are really struggling to keep cool. Uh, a lot of focus on, uh, on AC adoption by many, many people. But of course, if you, if you have so many people buying ACs, you're increasing the load. And by the way, if you're increasing the load, but the grid is not getting better when you have load shedding, you don't have access to that cooling, right? So, Passive design would be a much better way to ensure that people are cool than having to rely on, on these uh, mechanical devices. But nonetheless, I mean, the grid really will, will, you know, may, may be able to, to, to keep up, but only if you really figure out how to keep the load growth from the ACs of getting really out of hand. And so uh, you really have to keep those standards rigorous. So here's an example of this. So Brookings India did a report earlier this year on the future of Indian electricity demand. And if you look at residential appliance consumption, right now room ACs, this purple are at 7%, but the projection is by 2030, this will be 45% of residential demand. More and more people are entering this this middle class income bracket, they can afford the ACs, they go buy the ACs, frequently they buy the cheapest one, which is not the most efficient one, they put it in and then the, 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 the demand goes up, right? You see some great progress on things like lighting, right? Lighting goes and, uh, you know, tubular lighting, these, these things, the share goes down because of the switch to LEDs, right? People are getting to the more efficient lighting, so that's very good. Um, you know, not a huge change in, in refrigeration or, or televisions, but this AC load growth, that's, that's the big uh, issue going forward. So we need policy approaches to, uh, to adjust to, um, to, to these uh, challenges. Uh, this uh, program for energy efficiency in buildings put out a report recently. Um, this is a German uh, and uh, I think uh, French, French initiative, uh, better design for cool buildings, how improved building design can reduce the massive need for space cooling in hot climates. So I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to have, have a look at that. If you just look up uh, PEEB, you, you can see it. I can also supply links, but they have a couple of, uh, a couple of important uh, takeaways I captured here. Uh, I like this avoid shift and improve, right? So avoid bad building design, right? Building design needs to be adapted to the local climate to avoid high cooling demand. These tall buildings with lots of glass are not the right way to have adaptive design. I once saw um, a uh, presentation, I meant to look him up, I don't remember his name, um, uh, but there's, uh, there's a rather famous Indian architect. He's also a winemaker. <laughs> so maybe some of you will know who I'm talking about, but he, he incorporates a lot of traditional Indian designs in his buildings, right? And a lot of these 
you know, the, the, the people learn through thousands of years in trial and, of trial and error to make very smart designs. We actually are, are doing fairly dumb designs now, right? Lots of tall buildings. <laughs> and of course, it's everywhere, right? You look at Dubai, <laughs> what do you see? You see these tall, very interesting architecturally buildings, but they're absolutely worst for efficiency, right? All these windows exposed to the sun, right? No shade uh, built in. Um, really difficult. So avoid bad building design, shift to renewable energy to replace carbon intensive energy supply. This is really, there are a couple ways to do this. Uh, commercially in India, you see lots of people doing uh, renewable energy purchases. So you, you, you make an agreement to get your energy from some renewable source somewhere. You have, a, you have your own agreement with that, with that developer. Um, then you, uh, or you can do it on site. You can own it yourself if you're, if you're very ambitious. So the data centers, right, have done a lot of this kind of thing, right? Bangalore is, I mean, known, known for, for, for this kind of thing because of, because of the tech industry, right? Um, so whether you're purchasing it or whether you're installing it your, your, yourself or whether if you have sufficient uh, roof area, whether you're putting it on your own, uh, your, your own building, this is good, and then, and then obviously improve efficient systems and appliances to reduce cooling demand. So the policy recommendations, of course, um, they're very much tied to uh, sort of um, uh, climate action. So they they focus on integrate building designs into cooling strategies. I'll talk about India's cooling strategy, but also these NDC targets, these nationally determined contributions. These are the goals that countries are setting for themselves in the climate negotiations. Adopt and enforce ambitious building energy codes for new buildings and renovations. We talked about that. Uh, financial incentives, information campaigns, and capacity building to promote energy efficient building design. Uh, develop minimum energy performance standards and labeling for appliances. And then make low income housing energy efficient to ensure cooling for all and reduce energy poverty. I know there are many schemes uh, for, um, for low-income housing in India. I don't know actually the extent to which any of these uh, cooling measures or traditional building measures are being incorporated in some of them, but I would think it would be very, very important for, um, for low income especially uh, who will not be able to, to, to cool. And the cooling problem is only going to get worse as, as the temperatures rise. So that's kind of some big picture things. Now I'll go a little more into sort of, uh, you know, some practical elements. So talk about cool roofs and, and pavements. So if you talk about uh, technologies in near-term timelines, um, this is from, uh, there's something called the uh, Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, Global ABC. Um, they uh, put out every year a roadmap for buildings and construction towards a zero emission efficient resilient buildings and construction sector. Um, and they also have chapters. They have a chapter in India. They, they, it's, it's a little bit also, there's like uh, the World Green Building Council, WGBC, there's an IGBC. Um, so there are these organizations. I know there's the, there's the Green Building Center in Hyderabad uh, that I had the pleasure of visiting uh, one time. Um, you know, there are, um, there are organizations who are advocating for, for, for these types of things, not just the ones writing these, these big reports in, uh, you know, in Europe or US. But um, one of the, th you see the things they talk about, this is for new buildings, right? Building envelope, obviously critical. Passive design, very important. External shading. But then you get to reflective surface finishes, right? So this is one of the things they're talking about. Insulation, windows, uh, daylighting, design tools, right? These, these are all things I'm sure are familiar to you, but reflective surface finishes. Well, what are they talking about there? Um, so they're really talking about the albedo effect. So if you take, here's 37 degrees Celsius, there's a black roof over here, and you have the sunlight coming in, you have 38% of this is infrared energy that just heats the atmosphere. You've got 52% that goes up a little further and that heats the city air, right? It's just heating, not like just on the surface, but it's going up and being absorbed in the neighborhood, right? 
only 5% is reflected back into space. This is the visible stuff that just goes straight back up. But it's really this thermal uh, reflection, right? That, that gives the local heating. So you have half of that energy coming in is heating the, the city air. Four and a half percent is, is, is heating the building. Now, if you have a, a, white, a white roof, what happens is you get, of course, a huge amount of that energy is reflected. 80% is reflected. But only that's, that's mainly visible, right? So the infrared, uh, because it's not absorbed and re-emitting in the infrared, right? Uh, most of that energy is reflected. Only 8% um, heats the city air down from, from 52, right? So you're, you're talking about uh, six and a half uh, times reduction for this local heating effect. And you have a, th may not seem like much, four and a half to one and a half, but it's a third, right? So you have a third of the uh, heat transfer into the, the, the building itself. You also have 37 degrees and your roof is at 80 degrees, whereas the white roof is at 44 degrees. So you also have thermal cycling of these materials, right? Which you know uh, de degrades those materials over time. So you see already just from the roofs, we're, we're getting a sense of there's the local benefit, there's the benefit to the building itself, but you also have this broader neighborhood, or, you know, community, city-wide benefit from, from these, uh, these reductions. So um, you have energy and cost savings potential. The cost is low, so it's a short payback period because you're, you're, saving, you're saving money in the building, and so you can pay back the... Uh, the relatively low cost of, of, of putting the reflective surface on. You have improved roof life because you have smaller temperature fluctuation. You have thermal comfort and reduced AC load in the building. Now, if you're talking about pavements, it, actually the same thing applies. The materials are different, but you know, you know what it's like. And, you know, you're in the city, you're surrounded by concrete. The concrete is absorbing all of that heat. Right? And it's just re-emitting it. You feel it coming from the surface. You can't walk on it in the sunlight in your bare feet, right? So um, it, that's the heat island effect, right? So you're looking at the air temperatures across a region. You, you look at it over a city and the city is much hotter because it's absorbing all that energy and re-emitting it in the infrared. So, um, th so you reduce that effect. You reduce the heat related deaths from the people who are not sheltered in, in the city or don't have access to, to uh, fans or, or AC. And of course you reduce cooling demand, which is critical for things like load shedding and uh, the ability to, um, uh, to meet the electricity demand. Now, uh, cool roofs don't have to be white. White gives you the best benefit, but here's uh, something from uh, an American company talking about standard concrete tiles. And if you do a, a cool coating, remember it's really, you wanna reflect a lot of the visible light, but you also wanna have that infrared, um, uh, not have the infrared absorption. So, so you can actually have a variety of, of colors. And you can see here, um, so this is, you know, this is the, the uh, reflect, reflectivity with uh, the standard materials and, and, and the coating applied. Here's a surface temperature change as a function of solar reflectance. So again, if you have standard, standard color, colored tile or shingle, you're up at 80 degrees back, you know, with this 37 degree air temperature. As you change the, uh, the type of material that you're using, you get down to this reduced temperature. So white shingles or tiles or metal are, are best, but you get some benefit from even from other ones. But, and this is, this is important, you're looking at the material itself. It's not just the color to your eyes, right? Because you're not seeing in the infrared. You need the whole spectrum of what the roof is doing. So it's not just paint. So some people think, oh, I just paint my roof white. I have the benefit. It, it has to be a coating, not, not just the paint. So I don't expect you to read all this, but if you go, if you look at this publication, A Practical Guide to Cool Roofs and Cool Pavements, this is www.coolrooftoolkit.org. Hard to say fast, coolrooftoolkit.org. Um, they have some great data. And uh, so you see here uh, various types of roofs. Some of them you don't see very much in India, like asphalt shingles, uh, and of course, normally you don't, you know, a lot of flat roofs in India versus pitched roofs in, uh, in the US and Europe. But 
st still same thing, flat roofs, you can have, you know, liquid applied coating or a uh, single ply membrane. You have different options and, and you get information about the lifetime and the reflectance. And um, so I encourage you to go look at that. Um, same thing for pavements, actually, you, uh, you, can, you can look at uh, different types of pavements and, and various types of coatings or aggregates or cement. Um, and, and you look at sort of lifetime and you look at uh, reflectivity. So you can even, uh, you can even have this applied uh, more generally to these surfaces. So I will tell you that um, when, uh, when I was running the Clean Energy Ministerial Secretariat in the Department of Energy, which was 2010 to 2014, um, we actually had the fourth Clean Energy Ministerial meeting in, in New Delhi. It was hosted by the Indian government. Um, it was, uh, was a really fantastic event. One of the things that we had going on at that time was um, a, uh, a cool roofs initiative. And actually, um, there's an interesting story about this. From uh, the first term of the Obama administration, 2009 through 2012, the, the energy secretary was Stephen Chu. He's a famous uh, physicist, Nobel Prize winner, incredibly smart guy, very humble, nice, nice guy too. Um, he was really an efficiency guru. I mean, he just loved efficiency. And we had these big meetings with people, you know, energy ministers sitting around the table. And, you know, these mostly are not technical people. And he would show slides with efficiency uh, benefits and things. And uh, they would just sort of smile. And, but what, but, he used to be, he spent most, he's at Stanford now, but he spent most of his career at Lawrence Berkeley uh, lab at, uh, at, at uh, Cal, Cal Berkeley. And there's a gentleman who passed away recently called Art Rosenfeld. And Art Rosenfeld is often called actually the real guru of efficiency in the, in the US. And he was a big advocate for cool roofs. He is the one who actually first started publishing papers on the benefits of cool roofs. So if you go back to the history of cool roofs, Art Rosenfeld um, was, uh, was, was the guy uh, who, who really pushed this forward. But then when Steve, Steve Chu was good friends with Art Rosenfeld, when he came to the Department of Energy, he um, initiated, he wanted to have as part of this ministerial process a cool roofs initiative and he got it going but after he left it kind of died away i didn't see much action but now um there's something i'll tell you about in just a minute the kigali cooling efficiency program this program actually just last year did a million cool roofs challenge they're reinvigorating the activity on cool roofs um, they have uh, two million dollars uh, split among 10 teams in different countries around the world. Uh, India, I don't know if they had applications. I know you can see the 10 finalists. There's not one from India. I think there's one from Bangladesh, um, in, in, you know, from regionally speaking. But um, uh, anyway, you can, you can go uh, look at this and see uh, these finalists. But they are all working in different countries around the world to try to promote cool roofs. So there's some reinvigorated activity going, going on. Let me talk about uh, the last, last topic I want to, to address is um, cooling efficiency and, and, and the HFC phase out. And then and I will take some questions. Um, so I don't know how many of you follow the details of this. It, 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 it's, uh, it, it's sort of very complicated. I find it you know, sort of very interesting to my, my techie side. But um, so the Montreal Protocol, most of us are familiar with because it's the famous uh, agreement. Uh, most successful environmental agreement in history that, that was, uh, everybody agreed to reduce the ozone de depletion from chlorofluorocarbons, right? This is, this is uh, uh, CFCs and HCFCs. These were the common refrigerant gases. Freon, right, was the original one, du a DuPont product, right? Well, people often, people are, aren't deep in the weeds of the climate process often say, well, why can't we do climate change just like we did Montreal Protocol? 
But the difference is this is really like one technology problem that was solved by switching an F, F gas to a non to a to a uh, a non ozone depleting gas, and Dupont and Honeywell and and very soon international companies, many in India, were manufacturing these new gases, and so the problem was solved. It was not nearly as extensive a problem as climate change, so it was really. Um, uh, is successful at reducing uh, the ozone emissions. But what wasn't really fully appreciated at the time was that those gases actually have also had an extremely high climate impact. There's something called the, the ODP, the ozone depleting potential, and the GDP, the, green, the, the greenhouse uh, gas uh, uh, depleting of, of or the forcing potential, I forget the exact name, but anyway, the, the GWP, yeah, global warming potential, that's it. Um, so carbon dioxide is one. That's, that's just by definition, they say, okay, the, the global warming potential of carbon dioxide is one. Methane, we hear a lot about, uh, particularly from fracking in the US, for example, you have leakage of methane. This is bad, it's 28 times CO2. Um, Nitrogen oxide mainly is something you worry about from agriculture or some industrial processes. But look at these, CFC 12 was Freon 10,000. The same amount of emissions of, of uh, Freon, uh, 10,000 equivalents of CO2. Now, back in the day before Montreal, people, you, you had a leak, they just, they just vent it, right? You just vent the refrigerator to the air, nobody cared. Right, and then after Montreal, the regulations came in. No, you have to capture it, right? And you have to take it to to a central place, and it gets processed and and, and destroyed. Compliance, like anything, always an issue. Some guys, you know, still releasing, but we've seen the the, the decreases over time. It turns out they didn't even know they were doing it, but by removing these things uh, through the Montreal Protocol they have saved us one degree of Celsius warming by mid-century. It was actually the single biggest thing that's been done to reduce climate impacts, and it wasn't even intentional. But then they had another problem. They didn't realize that the substitutes for these F gases, which are very often HFC-23 or HFC-134A, these are the things used in refrigeration systems now, also had high GWP, global warming potentials, even though they had zero ozone depleting potential. So they're safe for ozone. But now the world through the, the treaty and through complicated financial mechanisms moved together and with technical and financial assistance to switch from Freon, these chlorofluorocarbons, to get to these substitutes and then countries like, like India and China and many others started producing these substitutes on their own it's a profitable business. And then they realized, oh, we still have a climate problem. So then the problem is that the, the, it's very complicated as a really crazy diplomatic dance because these are the substitutes for the ozone problem, but because they're not ozone depleting, the Montreal Protocol doesn't have anything to do with them. Now, these are their good gases for them. They say, we're done, right? But the climate convention said, yeah, but you guys have all of the technical knowledge about this. You know the compression cycles and the performance of the working fluids and all of this. So they had to work out. They didn't want to work together. It took a lot of effort, but finally they worked together and they now have something called the Kigali Amendment. And this was an amendment that agreed to put together a program to help transition now away from these gases to yet another transition to things that have much lower um, uh, global warming potentials. So KSEP, the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program is underway with a lot of philanthropic dollars. KSEP is assisting countries to develop cooling action plans. This starts with a needs assessment, like some of the things I've shown you, what's the expected growth in cooling demand over time. They run some models, scenario-based cooling needs. 
and then they take into account what are we trying to do with sustainable development goals or climate mitigation or of course in, uh, uh, meeting the needs of uh, those in poverty of course the nationally determined contributions the climate goals all of this goes together in something called the cooling action plan now india actually played a major role in uh, in the negotiations around the Kigali Amendment. And so I'm happy to say India has an India Cooling Action Plan. And so you can see this came out in March of 2019. And uh, you can look at it, it has a number of recommendations, but I just took one of them here. One of the plan's recommendations is focused on the role of buildings and appliances. It's accelerate reduction of the cooling load of the building sector through fast-tracked implementation of building energy codes. Easy to say, harder to do, right? Um, adoption of, of adaptive thermal comfort standards. Ratchet up energy efficiency of room air conditioners and fans and enhancing consumer awareness through eco-labeling of cooling products. Those are some, some recommendations. Um, and they're looking in light of the, they, they did their own modeling of the building area and they determined that in India, it will go up by 3x up to 2037 and 38. I think I said 5x to 2050, so it's, it's consistent. Look at the role of climate appropriate design in building energy efficiency. This will become increasingly important in terms of reducing cooling load requirements. So I think you can look for a future government action on this. And I think it represents an opportunity. The opportunity will not go away. This is going to be a bigger problem. The world is getting hotter. The demand for cooling is getting stronger. That's going to stress the energy systems. It's going to, you have all kinds of awful side effects, heat related deaths, um, decreased productivity of workers. You have a lot of challenges associated with this. So any of you working on this problem, you, you, can, you should be able to stay busy for, for a long time. So that's, um, that's all I have for, for now. Uh, I've included, I'll, I'll have at least in the presentation, I've included references uh, or, or uh, links to most of these things. They're all available online um, and, and hopefully lots of, uh, lots of good information for you. But I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, those of you who have questions can please unmute yourself and let us know um, what your questions are. Yeah. Uh, good morning. I'm Professor Puttaswamy. Can I ask questions? Please go ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, uh, I compliment uh, uh, Ms. Ramurthy for organizing. Uh, it was a nice uh, session, actually, and we got a lot of uh, information on uh, cool roof and energy efficiency, efficiency building. Uh, actually, I have a few questions. Uh, one is uh, this, uh, what are the aspects to be considered to reduce uh, surface area exposure in order to reduce the heat, heat island effect? That is my first question. I think, uh, uh, I think uh, Mr. Dr. Graham can answer. Sure. Yes. Shading. Uh... Shading is very important, right? Trees are very important, right? Sh shading, so, uh, you know, I said like these these very tall exposed buildings, right? I mean, they're, they're efficient from uh, the standpoint of packing humans into a small space, but they're not efficient in any other way, really, right? They're exposed to the sun. If you have buildings like that, at least having some sort of shade structures on them to reduce the thermal loading on the building itself. I've seen this in some passive buildings. Um, you can be very sophisticated, make them expensive, they tilt over time, but normally all you need to do is have them in a fixed position so that for the hottest part of the day, they're shading um, the, the portions of the building, uh, particularly the windows. Um, but in terms of the, the, uh, the city pavements themselves, trees or other kind of shade structures be very beneficial. Okay, so you mean to say there's some kind of a projections, recessed windows are something useful to reduce the surface area? I, I don't know anything about reducing the surface area. I think you just want to reduce the area that's exposed to the sun, okay. right? You, you want to minimize that. The surface area itself, 
you know, I, I think it's about the materials. Uh, I mean, humans will expand, the cities will expand, the surface area will, will go up. Um, I, I, you know, I think there are probably some very interesting traditional designs that, um, that could incorporate elements of uh, orientation of buildings, right? We, we do orientation of buildings based on the layout of the streets, right? not based on what makes sense in terms of sun exposure, right? Uh, things like that. That doesn't reduce the area, but it reduces the heat load by, by designing to, for the sun. Okay, okay. Sir, uh, I have a, another question actually. Most of the modern building uh, energy is consumed uh, because of this uh, hydro pneumatic pumping system in uh, plumbing system. Uh, in in olden days, actually, there is a one over a tank, and then there is a single pipeline which is connected to most of the utilities. See, nowadays, what they are making the uh, the modern designs are building with a in, uh, independent pipelines uh, with hydro pneumatic systems they are giving. So, what I feel because of this, uh, the lot of energy is being consumed uh, because of this uh, to maintain the pressure hydro pneumatic system. And uh, do you uh, think that is it, is it not a, a national waste considering uh, because maybe maintenance wise or maybe cost also is increasing the 30% pipeline, uh, the volume is increasing and cost is increasing. So what do you say? Uh, what do you, do you say? Uh, what is your opinion on this? I feel that that may be the wrong the design what the plumbing systems is being done uh, in the modern uh, uh, buildings. I mean, I think it's very important to make sure that the efficiency standards for the pumps used in those systems are maintained, right? You have to be using very efficient uh, pumps and, and, uh, and the motors, right? Variable speed motors, things like that, that, that take into account uh, the efficiency. I don't know anything about the calculation about the relative merits of on a building by building versus a system level. Um, I mean, I think you're talking about maintaining enough pressure in the system, right? To, rather than having a building by building pump. Yeah, I, I'm not that kind of engineer, unfortunately. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Doctor. Thank you. Uh, there is one question from Mr. Satya Prasad here. He's asking, can you suggest any open source software to simulate the building energy efficiency? Um, I am not an expert in that, but I know that it's available. Um, I would, there, there used to be in the uh, energy efficiency office in the Department of Energy, there was available a, a, a model that was, was open source. And that, that may still be, I could look for the link for it, but, uh, or I, or I could get you in, in touch with, uh, with somebody on that. But I myself have, have never, I know those models are there and they exist, but I have not been a user of them. You know, the other, um, um, these GBCs would know though, I mean, and they would know right for the Indian context, right? So just, uh, you know, con contacting IGBC and asking them that question, they, they would know where the, or the, um, the, 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 the Green Building Center in Hyderabad. I'm sure they, 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 must, they must know. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. So one of the participants mentions that there's a software called eQuest, which is freeware by Department of Energy. So probably that's something that uh, you would want to try. There you go, yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Ramutikara, do you have any questions? Would you want to um, ask any questions, please? You are on mute, sir. Ramutikara, you are on mute. You need to unmute. I think uh, we seem to be very close to nine o'clock. So I, I don't have questions. <laughs> we need to. I think Sneha has some questions. Sneha, architect, has some questions. I just had one question. Uh, <clears throat> am I audible? 
Yeah, yeah. Yes, Neha. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, so, uh, Graham sir, I just wanted to know. We kept talking about uh, you know uh, energy efficiency with cool roofs and uh, external surface treatment. But how important is microclimate within the building to uh, achieve this energy efficiency uh, as a major goal? Yeah, I think that this is a really good question because. Um, <laughs> You know, these the uh, buildings are designed and checked out, but then often not rechecked in the actual use with the people in them, right? And the people represent a heat load, and the computers represent a heat load, right? And 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 if you don't go back and keep tuning the building based on how it's used, you don't achieve the benefits you expect. I've heard this a lot. Um, so, I think there are probably two two ways to think about it. One is if you wanted to be hands off, you can go down the path of, of making a smart building, right? Where the lights go off automatically, there's a temperature sensor, you even have in the very fancy buildings, you know, the windows will, will get darker, you know, you can do all kinds of fancy things. But, but even, you know, ab absent that, uh, just going back in and tuning the building when it's in use periodically, I think would be be very effective because if you have areas of high high traffic lots of lots of people lots of computers and you have uh, other areas uh, that are less but your your airflow and your cooling is 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 treating them equally you're not going to get good good results and you'll feel this variation around the building so hvac systems really need to be to be tuned inside the building because of that thermal that thermal load that you speak of, right? Especially when we talk about the orientation problems, you know, one side of the south side of the building is going to is going to be up, be hotter than the north side of the building, right? So yeah, I, I, that's a, a very good point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe you can take a couple of more questions, uh, Chaitanya. Uh, so yeah, we still uh, have. I have. Uh, my name is. Uh, Dr. Banu, I am from Bangalore. Uh, a really nice presentation, a lot of information. And uh, thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, of course, I would, pleasure. I would uh, request you to elaborate a bit more on the infrared uh, uh, that you made a passing reference to. We had uh, heard of uh, ultraviolet, but this infrared uh, appears to be a new input in this. And uh, my takeaway from this is that uh, it's not just a paint that's going to help. It's got to be a, an appropriate coating. So in, in relation to this, uh, coating, paint, infrared, and ultraviolet, how would you please explain that? Thank you. Yeah, it's a bit like the greenhouse uh, effect, you know, for, for the atmosphere, right, is, is the... Um, you have the lot the um, you have the shorter wavelengths of light that uh, that travel through the atmosphere unimpeded right so if you have a bright surface that's why in that diagram we had side by side the black surface and the white surface so much of the the, the, the light from from the, uh, the the bright surface is is reflected that's the visible spectrum but if, if it's a dark surface or if it's just a, a painted surface, the challenge is that uh, much of that, if the energy is not reflected, it's absorbed, right? And with a, with a black surface, much of that visible light that could be reflected away is then absorbed. But when it's absorbed, what it means is it's heating the material. And then when you heat the material, that material is then emitting an infrared, right? And, and the infrared is just the heat, is, is, is the way the heat is released. I mean, obviously there's, you know, there's convection, there's conduction, but then there's the, therm the thermal radiation, right? The infrared. And so that, that means that uh, that infrared goes up. Now, infrared is blocked by water vapor. That's, that's why the greenhouse effect is, you know, the, 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 the light comes in as, vi as visible light, heats up the earth, the infrared tries to go out, but it's blocked by the water vapor and it's contained in the earth by this blanket, right? And that's the same as the local effect, right? The pavement heats up, the roof heats up, 
when it heats it emits it takes that energy that came into it as visible and releases it as infrared and so uh and that infrared is then trapped right and that's what you feel you feel the warmth so um the material properties um have to mainly be about reflecting that income incoming radiation rather than absorbing that's the first the first thing but but, but reflecting that radiation has something to do with thickness, not just what, what our eyes see as a very, if you have a thin white layer, it may be, appear to be bright to us, but the, but the radi some of that visible radiation is going through and still heating underneath that surface. And then it's going to heat up and then it's going to emit in infrared. So that's why not paint, but coating. I don't know the details of how thick that coating has to be. The difference between, um, between paint um, and, and, and the coating, but I imagine it's, you know, it's probably, um, you know, it's still probably less than a millimeter, right? It's probably a fairly thin coating, but it's, but it's uh, different than, than, than paint. Ultraviolet, I don't really know. Uh, yeah, I, th I think it should just be re re reflected like the visible light. It's the, it's, it's the absorption of the energy and conversion to infrared that creates the heat ion. All right. Um, I may I may intervene. Um, you know, uh, the what is known as uh, reflectivity, emissivity, and uh, solar reflective index, or the components based on which CRC gives the energy star classification. I think it can't be done in the effect of painting. It may be so in the effect of coating because it has to comply with so many other ASTM standards. Only then, I think. Uh, it, it qualifies for energy stuff. Yeah, I think also durability, right? So, so paint is not going to be as durable as a as a coating. Yeah. All right. Uh, so it's time. Uh, all the participants, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any further questions, please do send us an email, um, and uh, we'll get back to you with clarifications. Graham, thank you so much for making time and joining us. It will be an honor. It was an honor hosting you. Um, we look forward to uh, connecting with you again and taking this forward. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for participating. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. Take care. Thanks, Graham. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice your dinner. Is not, your dinner is not getting delayed, Graham. <laughs>